All right, over the past few weeks, uh, we've been talking about Jesus. Uh, in fact, there's two titles to this whole series. It's called Only Jesus or The Names of Jesus. And it's been really exciting. It's been quite deep. It's been a, a, quite insightful. And if you remember, we talked about Christ as the Alpha and the Omega. Omega. And then uh, when it came to Easter Friday, we talked about Jesus as the Lamb of God or the Passover Lamb. And then we had Christ last week. We had Christ, our Redeemer. And this one you didn't hear because it was preached actually in Doreen and, and Pastor Darren, for, I, saw, I saw even his notes, he talked about the great I am, Jesus as the great I am. And so today I, I just want to, uh, to wind this thing up and I want to talk about Christ as the Lord of Compassion. Christ as the Lord of Compassion. And it's not so much a title, but it's the dominant theme of his ministry. So when you look at the Gospels, are, are you ready to go a little bit deeper today, by the way? Yeah. All right. I, I'm assuming this is a long weekend that most people here, again, are going to be probably Christian or Christian background, so you should know a little bit of Scripture. So I'm going to go on a bit of a journey. So are you okay? But you've got to help me to preach. Yeah. Okay? All right. Cool. If, when you look at the Gospels as a composite whole, uh, you're going to find some things that stand out about Christ. Number one, you'll find that, yes, that he was the fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Testament. Yes, absolutely. Yes, he was holy. So much so that the disciples fell to the ground because they were aware of their sinfulness. Get away from me, Lord. You, you, you are, you, just who are you? Yes, he was a mighty teacher who confounded even the PhDs of the scribes. They were the, the intellects of those days. But the dominant trait, if you were to look at who, what he did, the inner core, that naturally, what naturally flowed out of Christ everywhere, in every gospel, is compassion. Compassion for fallen humanity. Constantly, he's healing, he's embracing, he's forgiving, he's, he's reaching out to those who least deserve it. Let me give you a scripture here. James chapter 5, verse 11. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord. Now read the next part, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He is compassionate and merciful, not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. So I want to take you to a story today that really brings this out. And at the end, by the way, just get yourself prepared. We're going to have a time of prayer. We're going to anoint you with oil. We're going to believe that God will touch you. Okay? Amen? In Mark chapter 1, verse 40, it says this, the story of the leper. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, uh, kneeling said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. And moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him and he said, I will. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Wow. Here's a few things about the leper's condition, because some of you may not understand this, but leprosy was a debilitating skin condition that a lot of people felt in those days was highly contagious, not, not unlike a little bit of COVID, but far worse. Many people thought that leprosy actually was a punishment from God, that it was a punishment for the sin of slander and gossip. Let me tell you, there'd be a lot of people with leprosy today or for some secret sin that they had committed. Leprosy robbed the man of everything. Robbed the man of his name. He was no longer John or Paul. He was the leper. There's the, there goes the leper. He robbed him of his occupation. Nobody wanted to hire a leper. As soon as they found out, get out. He robbed him of his home. They had to live in a, lepra, uh, a leprosy colony. Uh, they robbed him of his family. If he had a wife, it'd be a long time since he'd embraced his wife. If he had children, he was not allowed to bring them near, to kiss them, to be anywhere near where they were. It robbed him of his dignity. Often you would see lepers walking, even today in certain parts of the world, that their, their hair is disheveled, their, their clothes are torn, that, 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 and in this case, they had to cry out from a distance, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine doing that? What that would do to you? But this leper takes a huge risk. He leaves his leprosy colony, something he shouldn't have done, and he walks towards Jesus. 
And I want you to notice that Jesus' response is not, get away from me, what are you doing here? You should be back in your leprosy colony. You, you don't belong here. He had every right to do that. In fact, the law would insist that he did that, but Jesus did not do that. Because with Jesus, things were different. In the Old Testament, if an, old, if an unclean person touched a clean person, the clean person would become unclean. But with Jesus, who was the clean? When he touched an unclean person, they became clean. I think that's a good time to praise God. Yeah. And the implications of this are immense because all of us are unclean. You know, the Bible says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fail to live up to our own expectations. We disappoint ourselves. Have you ever said to yourself, I'm I'm disappointed in myself? Have you ever said that? Can you imagine the standards of God? We all fail, but when we come to God, He doesn't push us back. When we come to Christ, He doesn't push us back. In fact, Jesus said these words, I have not come for the self-righteous, but I've come, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, I've come to seek and to save the lost. And then he said something else in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, I've not come for the well, but I've come for the sick. Nothing gave Jesus more joy than when he healed those who were in their soul and in their spirit and in their body sick. Nothing gave him more joy. Can you imagine a doctor compassionate doctor leaving his home and going to maybe to a faraway tribe and, and because there's a sickness there that is killing people off and they have no cure. And so at great expense, he, he goes and he diagnoses what the illness is and, and then he leaves the safety and the comfort and the opulence of where he lives and at his personal expense, he brings in all the medical equipment and all, all the medication. He goes out in the middle of nowhere. But when he gets there, They want nothing to do with him. They they say, well, we don't trust your medicine. We have our own medicine. His heart is broken because he realizes with their own medicine, it's not going to work at all. But then slowly, one of the young men comes forward. He says, okay, I'll give this thing a try. And he he takes the men. He begins to improve. Then another person comes forward, and he, he begins to improve. And then there's another one, and another one, and another one. Suddenly, all the tribe is coming forward. How does the doctor feel? He's overjoyed because that's why he came. That's why he came. And the same thing with Christ. When you and I come to him, whether it's for the first time or the millionth time, for pardon, for forgiveness, for all of our problems, the things that concern us, he doesn't push us away. That's why he came. That's why he came. That's why he suffered. That's why he died. That's why he came back to life again. That's the reason he came. That's in his heart. That's the heart of Christ. You see, when your, when your sin and my sin comes, to, when, when it's exposed, it doesn't cause God to move away. He's not repulsed by that. It's the reason he came. He came to minister. He draws even closer to us because he realizes we're in deep trouble. We're in deep trouble. So we go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 44, and Jesus moved with compassion Other translations say deeply moved. He stretched out his hand and he touched him. You see, compassion is not something that Jesus had to conjure up. Compassion is not something, a feeling that came on him now and then, you know. Oh, I've got to feel compassion. It was not that. It was who he is, who he was, wave after wave. You look everywhere in the Gospels and move with compassion. And move with compassion. If you had the, and move com- with compassion. And move with compassion. That is the heart of Christ. It's the heart of God. In supporting the weak. Move with compassion. He healed the sick. Move with compassion. He fed those who are hungry. Move with compassion. See, he sought the lost. Move with compassion. He ministered to those who were bereaved. Remember the woman in Luke chapter 7. And there's this woman and she's lost her only son. She's a widow. I don't know whether Jesus recalled losing his stepfather. I don't know what was actually happening there, but he goes up to the woman. She's crying, her only son. And she goes, he goes up to her and says, don't weep. Do not weep. And he turns to the, the dead boy 
And he says to him, and the word, the word of God says, a move with compassion. He says, young boy, I tell you, rise up. And the boy stands up, and then he takes the boy, and he presents him to the mother. I think the Lord deserves praise. Amen. That's the God we serve. That's the compassion of Christ. You see, whenever Jesus is confronted with fallen humanity, his, his deepest impulse, his natural instinct is to move towards sin and suffering, not away from it. What pours out of Christ most naturally is not judgment, but mercy. Watch it. Read it. And it's not as if Jesus in the Gospels is compassionate and God in the Old Testament is angry. It's not the way it works. Because you've got to understand that they are one and the same. Think about this. Jesus of the New Testament is Yahweh of the Old Testament. They are one and the same. Do you remember? And I'm not denying here the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm not denying that at all. But they are one and the same in essence, in character, in nature. They're one and the same. We sometimes misunderstand the Scripture. Do you remember the time when Moses comes up to God and he says, God, I'm leading these people and they are driving me crazy. The Israelites were so stubborn and so difficult to deal with. And he says, just, just give me a glimpse. I mean, just give me a glimpse, God, of your glory, of who you are, and I'll be satisfied. There'll be enough to keep me going. But God doesn't give him a, 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 a it doesn't give him a blinding, if you're like, revelation of his presence because if he did that, he'd die. He gives him a revelation of his nature. And I know I referred back to this uh, a couple of weeks ago. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, it says, and the Lord, he, he says, I am the Lord. This is the Old Testament. This is Yahweh. This is Jesus incarnate. This is the Holy Spirit. Right. I am the Lord, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And Moses go, thank God for that, because otherwise we'd all be destroyed. It's true. Now listen to me. Of course, if you consistently refuse God, you reject Him, you spurn Him, He will judge. Don't doubt. Don't, don't misunderstand. But listen to me. This is not his first response. There's a big difference. This is not his first response. This is not his automatic response. And neither is it his last response. Never. Never. Listen to what the Word of God says in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15. The Lord sent persistently to them his messengers because he had compassion on his people. He gave them chance after chance, after chance, after, after chance, time and time again, he warned them, he, he, he advised them. And even when God had no other choice, in Hosea chapter 11, verse 8 and 9, he says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over? He says, even though you deserve judgment, my heart recoils. Look at the translations. My heart is disturbed. My heart is torn. And my compassion overflows. You see, the God that we serve. It's like God is saying, why do you force my hand? Why do you want me to do that which is not in me, that which is not natural to me? Why are you putting me in such a position? I don't want to do that. It's not my heart. It's not the heart of Christ. It's not the heart of God. You know, it's a bit like a parent. So how many parents do we have here today? You know, a good parent takes no delight in punishment. If you do, you, you need a, you've got a problem. You need counseling. I mean, parents, they, they want to bless their children. They, they want to they, they be generous with their children. They, they want to be good to their children. That's in their heart. But sometimes it's like this forcing that I have to do it only because you, you put me in that position. Listen to Isaiah chapter 54, verse 7 and 8. Read it with me. Let's see if we can get it up here. Read it with me. For a brief moment, 
I deserted you. That's judgment, you see. But with great compassion, I will gather you. I will gather you. He says, I, I had to inflict a small amount of pain just to bring you back to myself, but it's not where I live. You see, it's impossible to overemphasize the compassion and the love of God. You, you can't go too far. Well, I, I, I know you, you can't deny the fact that there is judgment, but there is in the heart the first response of God toward you, toward broken humanity, toward that person who was, is maybe annoying you, maybe that person who was so evil, the first response that God has toward them is compassion. I was reading the story of Philip Yancey, one of the most prolific uh, writers in, in the Christian world, and he's written a lot of books, and one of his famous books is called Disappointment with God, and if you haven't read Disappointment with God, at some point in time you ought to read it. He's an evangelical. And he shares in that, in that book the story of his father. He never really got to know his father. He, his father died of polio when he was a really young child. And, you know, all, all, he missed out on all of that love. He just did not know him at all. And he tells that one day he went to his mother's home and he noticed that there was a little photo, this mangled photo, this crumpled up photo of him, of, of, of Yancey, a boy, when he was a baby. And he said, Mom, why, why are you keeping this photo of me as a baby? I mean, aren't there many other photos that you could have that, that there are better than this? This is worn and torn. And, and then she told him this story. She says, this is the photo that I gave to your father when you were a very, very young boy. Your father suffered with polio, and they put him in an iron lung. Now, for those of you, an iron lung machine, you've you got no idea what I'm talking about. So I'm going to put a photo up here so you get the idea of what's actually going on. So this is, the, this, it's not a very good, I could have, should have got one with a little bit better, but it, was, it encapsulated the whole of the man. They put him in there. Can I have the next one as well? If we got it, so there we go. It lie him inside there, they'd encapsulate the whole thing. So he was, you know, you couldn't get in there for a long, long period of time. It's the only way they would survive. Obviously, praise God today that it's no longer the issue. She said, I put a photo, I inserted a photo into the iron lung. And you can't recall this, but your father would look at that photo. He would gaze at the photo for weeks. And every time he'd look at that photo, he'd pray for you. And he'd think about you and your future. And Yancey says these words. He said, someone I have no memory of spent all day, every day, thinking of me, loving me as best as he could. Let me tell you, this is a powerful illustration of what God does with us. I don't know about you, but I feel like singing the song, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. And the Lord says to you today, I have watched you, and I have gazed upon you from the very first moment that you were born. When you took your first breath, I was there. When you began to walk, I watched and observed, and I was happy. When you went through your teenage years, yes, they were a little turbulent, but I never left you for a moment. When you went through that pain and that grief, I felt the pain with you. When people abandoned you, when there was that time when the, this injustice was done to you, when what should have not have happened, happened to you. And you were hurt, and you were angry. God says, I was angry with you. I was more angry than you were. But without sin. So therefore, cast your anger on me. When you moved away from me, I did not move away from you. I've never moved away from you. Why would you abandon this kind of love? 
Listen to what the Word of God says. You say, where do you get this from? Listen, listen to this, listen, listen. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. I will not forget you. I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. This is God, the compassionate one. This is the heart of Christ, who is compassion. <laughs> Let me take you back to the story, though. There's more. In Mark chapter 1, verse 41, it says this. Then Jesus moved with compassion, reached out his hand and touched him. I want to touch on something that maybe we don't talk about a lot, but I think we need to talk about it here. The word actually for compassion, it can actually be deeply moved, or it can be translated indignant. You check your translations, right? Or even angry. Hold on. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's going on here? You mean to tell me that... Compassion and anger, are, are, they, are they compatible? Well, apparently, yes. If you remember, when Jesus walked into the temple and there were merchants that were using an area that was supposed to be for prayer, that Jesus got what? Indignant. And he got angry. And he, and he took a whip and he, he, got, he said, out. This is messing with my head here. Hold on. You, you, you got me crying in one minute and then the, another minute. You, what are you saying? Well, let, let, let me just hold on here. So why in the story is Jesus compassionate, but he's also angry? Well, I don't know. But it could be, I'm just being faithful to the scripture, right? Okay. It could be, he's not angry with the man. Obviously, he's going to be healed him at the moment. He's not angry with him, right? So that can't be it. Maybe he was angry at the religious leaders, the way they were treating him. They said, not only do you put him in a leper colony, but you treat him as rubbish. Maybe he's angry with that. Maybe he looked at the man and he saw the, the fallenness of humanity and he saw what Satan had done and what, what sin had done and he said, he looks at him and there's, there's disease and sin and isolation and he sees this man is twisted and, and it's not meant to be that way. It's like, it's not right. He's getting angry. Maybe it was that. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I do know this, that whenever Jesus encountered suffering, and justice, and evil, and, and human cruelty, he was deeply moved, yeah, yeah. and he was disturbed, yeah. disturbed. I think we need a few more Christians who are disturbed. Yeah. Oh, I don't mean that way, you know. <laughs> no, not that way. Because you cannot have compassion unless you're deeply moved, yeah. sometimes disturbed and even angry what you see around the world. A God that doesn't get angry, a God that doesn't get upset or, or deeply moved is not a God that I want. I want a God who is deeply moved when he sees evil. Otherwise, he doesn't care less. It's just like when you see somebody who is addicted maybe to a life-controlling drugs or ice or whatever and there's a mixture of, of compassion, sadness, and sometimes a bit of anger as well. A bit of anger because you see this, this, this person who is a shell of what he could be, and it's like, look at the potential. What happened to the potential? Angry at the people who supply the actual drugs. Say, you have no conscience whatsoever. All you can think about is money. You can get angry at that. Angry at maybe even at Satan who is the mastermind of every evil thing in this world. You can get angry, maybe a bit angry, a bit compassionate, a little bit of sadness toward the user who said, you haven't made the right choice. And so compassion and anger can actually go together, indignation. We, 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 I, I think we need to pray sometimes along the lines, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. Sometimes we just got to say, it's not right. It's not right. It's not right that children are raped and enslaved by wicked men. That's why we get ourselves involved in, 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 in A21 that seeks to rescue them. It's just not right. It's not right that poor and the homeless and vulnerable are neglected. That's why we have all of these projects that encompass care. And it's growing by the, by the day. It's not right. 
that our children and our youth wander away from God. That's why we pour resources into the next generation. You know, many people come to our church because they say, what, what program do you have for children? What program do you have for youth? We say, we believe in youth. We believe in young adults. We're going to pour our resources into them. It's not right. It's not right. It's not right that marriages bust up. I know sometimes it's inevitable, but, but you know what? We're going to do our best. We're going to sow into it. We're going to instruct. We're going to counsel. We're going to advise. We're going to put, we're going to put on whatever seminars to make sure that we do our best. It's not right that we have no Christian voice in politics. It's not right because the Word of God says that righteousness exalts a nation. Now, we don't know what the answer is, but I'll tell you what. It ought to stir something up. It's not right that people don't have clean drinking water. That's why we're digging wells. We're going to Africa, we're going to different parts of the world. It's not right that people have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ because he is the only one that can save their life. That's why we'll keep on preaching, we'll keep on planning, we'll keep on putting new campuses, we'll keep on preaching the Word of God. We will be unstoppable because the Word of God has got to get out. Don't believe the lies that you see in the world. It's all an illusion. I was thinking about this. What we get through the media, what we get through advertising that this is going to make you happy, this is, this is all about, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. Only when you have Christ in your life that you are secure for all of eternity, that you know what life is all about. The compassion of Christ ought to compel us. And whatever the church of Jesus Christ have felt the heart of God, have held, felt the compassion of Christ, have seen the needs of the people that become a powerful force in society. What has happened is the poor have been fed. You read your history. Where do you think that hospitals came from? The advancement in medication, education, where do you think that came from? It came from Christians who said, you know what? We need to educate children. They need to have an education. We need to heal the sick because Christ was a healer. We need to be healers. We will do it through medicine. We will do it through touching people, believing for a healing touch. We will do whatever we can to bring healing into society. We'll change the laws. We'll do whatever we need. We'll set the slaves free. Final observation. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 42. And the leper came to Jesus and he implored him, begged him, kneeling, and he said to him, if you will, if you can make me clean, Jesus. And Jesus moved with compassion, reached out his hand and touched him. And he said, I will. That would have been such a moving moment. Yeah. This man who had not felt the touch of another human being. Mm -hmm. Jesus puts his hand on his head. I'm assuming. I can just see the, the leper putting his hand on Jesus' hand. And healing was taking place even before the miracle. Yeah. He was healing his soul. Yeah. He was healing his spirit. And then came the healing of his body. And the same Jesus who walked on the earth still is filled with compassion. And he's moving toward us today. It's not as if when Jesus went back to heaven that he lost all compassion. Oh no. The same Jesus who had compassion when he walked on the face of the earth still has compassion from heaven today. Still gazes at you today still intercedes for you today, still is your advocate today, still walks with you today. Nothing changes, nothing changes. And as I began to think about this message and I thought to myself, this would be a wonderful time to pray. He's moving toward you today. If there's sin, he's moving toward you with forgiveness. If there's grief, he's moving toward you with with healing. If there's confusion, he's moving toward you with peace. If there's whatever it is, Christ is moving toward you and I. I thought what a wonderful thing it would be, this, this one that we understand is 
this heart of the heart of Christ that for him to extend his hand toward us and to touch us with his hand and let him turn things around for him to do what we cannot do because when Jesus touched this man healing immediately took place he did what nobody else can do because when you receive a touch from God he'll do what nobody else can do and I don't know what you're here what you're facing today but I want you all to stand today and we've got some people who who are ready to pray and we're going to anoint you with oil and believe God and filled with compassion he reached out his hand that's what he wants to do today I want you to open up your heart just just for a moment and say Lord touch me everybody say that Lord touch me so we're going to spend just a few moments praying for people and I want you to step out of your seat and and let's come and come with a heart that says Lord touch me touch my brokenness touch my my area of need Lord I'm believing for a miracle. Lord, I know your heart, and I receive from you today. I receive you. Just step out of your sin. Let's come. Let's pray. Come on. Come on. Wherever you are, let's all come. All come. 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 Let's come. Let's come. And then don't look to man. Don't look to anybody. Just even as you come, say, Lord, touch me. Lord, touch me. Lord, touch me. Lord, touch me. Let your hand be extended toward me. And let I receive from you, even now. Even as they come, Lord God, even, even as they move toward you, even as this man moved toward you, he broke out of his isolation, he broke out of where he was. Lord God, the miracle is already starting to happen because you, Lord God, he was looking toward you. Lord God, I pray, even right now, in the name of Jesus, that you will extend your hand. And Lord God, to bring healing of the soul and the body and the spirit. Lord God, to bring, Lord God, peace where there's confusion. To bring, Lord, relief where there's pain. Lord God, to bring forgiveness where there's sin. To bring, Lord God, grace where there's judgment. Lord God, to bring what? To bring the goodness of God. I want you to begin to pray. Lift up your hands toward God today. And, and guys, I want you just to go around and just anoint them with oil. If you have oil with you, if you don't, just lay hands on them. Here they come. Just, just begin to pray. And we're going to sing this song, which is so beautiful, so capsulates what, what we're talking about today. And let's reach out to the Lord. Reach out and worship and let, let God touch you afresh in Jesus' name.